Pública. Good day and welcome to Issues and Answers, a production of the Government Information Service. I am your host for today, Mr. Jacques Hinson Compton. So today we're here to talk about the, very briefly, the St. Lucia Health System Strengthening Project, which is a collaborative effort of the World Bank and the Government of St. Lucia. Uh, but more specifically, we're going to talk about the monitoring and evaluation of an initiative within the project called performance-based financing. And with me to talk about this is Ms. Ira Isaacs, who is the monitoring and evaluation specialist of the St. Lucia Health System Strengthening Project. Welcome, Ms. Isaacs. Hi. Thank you for having me this morning. So let me just start off by very briefly having you explain about what the St. Lucia Health System Strengthening Project is in very brief terms. Very brief terms. So <laughs> what, a few years ago, and I have to say a few years ago, maybe like 10, five years, let's just say that, uh, we identified that there were some gaps in the health sector. Uh, we needed to have strengthened those gaps to improve the quality and the efficiency of our healthcare services. And so we came together with a framework. Um, part of that was national health insurance, uh, the performance-based financing project that you speak of. And uh, we, we recognized that we had really needed to improve our service delivery. And so the project aims to do that in many different aspects, yes. Okay, so also now I want to talk about monitoring and evaluation. Your, your responsibility, what yes. exactly is monitoring and evaluation? You know, you ask that question and it's always a little ticklish to <laughs> say exactly it's, it's, what it is. It's a very it's broad thing, isn't it? Very good, yes. But I think I would like to explain it in a way that other persons would understand. Let's say you want to cook a meal on a Sunday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 I like to use very simple terms. Let's say you want to cook a meal on a Sunday. You know all the ingredients that you need. You go to the supermarket. Uh, but before you do that, you write a list of things that you're going to get, mm -hmm. yes? You want to ensure that you get everything, so you don't get back home and you, you didn't accomplish your, the shopping. That's, that's why I need a list, because most times I'll forget. Very good. So that is called putting together the framework to ensure that the recipe, yeah, based on the recipe. Mm -hmm. You get to the supermarket. Maybe you have to look at, do you have enough funds? Do you have enough money in your pocket? And if you don't, <laughs> that means we're going to have to leave something behind. Yeah, but what do you leave behind when you have a recipe, right? A strict recipe. Mm -hmm. So monitoring what it really does, it, it, it looks at the framework. What do you want to do? What are your resources that are existing? Um, can we skip something to just to get it working? And we will monitor over time. Did we get all the ingredients that we need? Evaluation says, what did we learn after we cooked this meal? Mm -hmm. mm, maybe we shouldn't have missed that salt. <laughs> Maybe we should have added that extra couple of seasonings. Yeah. So it's a very kind of a trial and error. So while an initiative is being launched, or even before so, and while it goes on right. into its life, yes. you are evaluating very good. how effective it might be. Right. So for the healthcare sector, let me explain it this way. We want to increase screening for diabetes and hypertension. We say we want to have the ages 18 and above. Monitoring asks the question, how many of those 18 year olds and above did you capture, came for screening? But did you reach them? Were they satisfied with the services that you give them? And, and all that is part of evaluation because if they are not satisfied, what did we do wrong? Or what did we do right? And so this is what monitoring evaluation does, but it strictly depends on collecting information. You remember I said we need to get that recipe? Mm -hmm. So the collection of information says, uh, did we actually do the things we were supposed to do for the persons who we are supposed to do it for? Did we do it at the right time?
time. Did we inconvenience them at, in any way? And so we will go back and reevaluate because what we are focusing on in quality, improving the quality of our services, is that it's not just that it's convenient to me as a healthcare professional, but it's also convenient to our to the public as well, the families, the communities. And so it it, it calls for what we call co-design. It calls for co-design. And co-design says that we will not just say, okay, we're coming to do screening for diabetes and hypertension, but at what times can we come to you? What are, where are some of the places that we can come to you? Maybe you're going to the barbershop a lot, the salons, the market, and so it gives us the ability to just evaluate our services and how could we get it more accessible to the people without inconvenience in them. Mm. So monitoring helps, we have what we call indicators. So I, I want to maybe screen 50% of the population who is 18 and above. Now I have to identify where am I going to meet them. And then when I've identified that and I've gone maybe to the barbershops the market, were they pleased with it? If they weren't pleased, how do we fix that? So a lot of your monitoring and evaluation or your M&E process, it might involve um, interviewing patients. Right. And so this is something we want persons to understand. Uh, we, it will take uh, just a tat extra time. Yeah? A mm -hmm. tat extra time. Because sometimes persons come and we may spend, what, 20 minutes um, giving them care. Because we need to co collect the accurate information, you, the nurses would ask, your name, who is your next of family? What are your email address? Um, what are your contact numbers? Where do you live? Other than here, where else do you stay? And I know people think, you're trying to pry into my business. No, we're trying to collect as much information so that we can identify where you are when you need us and when we think that we need to come and meet you. So it does take time to collect this information. And we have a, a system called SLUIS. Most persons who have already accessed the, the care at the health facilities know that, you know, we are always on the computer, tablet, something, taking information. Mm -hmm. That is collecting information. And it will take some time for us to ask you the questions. Mm -hmm. We are asking, please, that you be as honest as possible with the questions uh, so that when we are doing interventions, and when I say interventions, let's say that there is a program where we say we are going to give monitors it's for, uh, for checking blood pressures. Mm? And we said we want to give these to our clients who we know have hypertension. Where are they? So we will put together that list based on the information that we have already gathered and then we will come to you. We will put a notice out, yes, but some, we, we, we want to move away from that aspect where the clients are always coming to us, the patients are always coming to us. Why can't we come to you and you need to help us come to you by giving us the correct information? So it does take time, yes, collecting okay. that information. Um, now that you... you briefly a while ago kind of touched on diabetes and hypertension mm -hmm. which is is very interesting and integral to pbf mm -hmm. or performance-based based financing. financing so briefly before we go on to our next break just mm -hmm. explain what performance-based financing is so some persons would hear the term result-based financing and performance-based financing so the performance-based financing we set what you call quality parameters quality parameters and one of them might be client satisfaction they're satisfied with what you're doing for them uh, it might be how many persons did you actually screen in a day so based on the quality parameters we evaluate we monitor and evaluate the the the, the healthcare service that is rendered by the healthcare professionals and the providers and what we do is that based on your services based on the, on, on on your quality of the services that you're giving then an incentive is given to you Okay, let me just put you on pause just for a few moments. We're due for a break. Mm -hmm. I'm Jacques Kingston Compton. You're watching Issues and Answers. Stay tuned until we return. The Department of Finance has introduced the Electronic Government Procurement System, EGP. The EGP system has many benefits for stakeholders involved in government procurement. And government seeks to adopt a strategic approach to its purchasing process. Electronic government procurement improves efficiency of procurement and enhances data capture. The EGP is innovative and will automate the sequence from notification, 
receiving an evaluation of submissions to final contract award. It improves communication between vendors and government agencies, provides greater transparency and builds confidence in the vendor community through increased access to information. To participate, vendors, suppliers and contractors must register on the electronic government procurement platform. EGP, improving efficiency and transparency in the acquisition of goods, books and services. Welcome back to Issues and Answers. I am here with Ms. Ira Isaacs, the Monitoring and Evaluation Specialist of the St. Lucia Health System Strengthening Project. And what we're talking about right now is monitoring and evaluation of an upcoming initiative in the, the St. Lucian health sector called performance-based financing. Mm -hmm. Yes, so Ms. Isaacs, before we went on the break, you were talking about uh, what exactly is the performance-based financing initiative. Yeah, so we call it pay for performance. Meaning to say, as I was explaining, based on your performance as a health care provider, uh, we give you the dimensions. So we say we want integrity in your services. We want the clients or patients to be satisfied. We want to look at the waiting time, how many persons, when you treat them, come back to you. Mm -hmm. So those are the cipher things that we will be looking at. And based on that, we will be giving them an incentives. Uh, what I would say, though, is not just looking at it from the client's perspective or patient's perspective, but also the healthcare professional's perspective. Uh, we want to know, are the interventions and the support that we're giving you in the project, is it really helping improve the quality of your services? And so when we look at value for money, that is something we're going to compare it to. And so remember I said about cooking a meal. Mm -hmm. What if after you've cooked the meal, based on the, let's say you paid, what, $200 for a nice, good, cooked meal. But then it didn't really come out the way you wanted it, and it's not every Sunday you can do it because it's expensive, mm -hmm. right? That's called value for money, right? So this is what we want to ensure that it's not just that we're giving you something, but that we're giving it to you in a manner in which we can continue to give it to you. And this is something that has been happening to us in healthcare. How do you place value on people's lives? How do you place value on doing something that's going to improve the quality of somebody's life? Mm -hmm. And so that is why the, the, the PBF, as we call it, the performance-based financing for non-communicable disease, which is hypertension and diabetes, we want to ensure that we, just doesn't, we don't come and just do something. We do it right. Mm -hmm. We do it for the people who actually need it and that we can sustain it, and that it actually has a benefit for you, for your family, for your community, in your workplace, national development, contributing back to our economical development. So these are the things that we really need to take into consideration. It's a new project. It has never been implemented before in mm. St. Lucia or the rest of the Caribbean, per se. Uh, it, you find this, this model in healthcare being implemented in middle, to higher development countries, <laughs> not a developing country mm -hmm. like, like St. Lucia. So this is our first time, so we really do have to look at it, monitor and evaluate it very closely. So can you go into a little bit more detail why and how it's going to be monitored and evaluated? Like why does PBF, in a, in a broader sense, need to be monitored, monitored and evaluated? Well, as I said, it's new. And any, anything new needs to be evaluated on the impact. So we said we are going to improve screening and patient management for diabetes and hypertension. The reason why we are monitoring it, as you said, is that we want to ensure that we, we capture the right amount of persons, that we are not doing any harm to you, that we learn our lessons as we go forward to do risk management. It, that's important, mm -hmm. managing the risk. Are we overspending? Are we spending enough? Are we actually capturing the right needs of the patients and their families, the community? Are we overburdening the healthcare professionals? We need to monitor that. Mm -hmm. We need to monitor that. And as we learn the lessons in the evaluation aspect of it, we will make our changes. There is a, there is a model that is usually termed and anyone who has done quality management system, and I'm saying to Betty Combi and the Bureau of Standard now, I'm calling their names, they have been improving 
the understanding of persons in what quality is. And we have a model we call plan, you do it, you check, and then you act. So you plan, we have already planned what we are going to do. Then we are going to actually do it. Based on what we say we are going to do, we are going to check. The monies, how the, our professionals and our patients feeling, mm. how is it impacting the community, and in any way we will, best practices, great, we've got that down. Practices that are not doing well, let's reevaluate it. Let's go back to the drawing table, and that's the act. The act says if it's not going well, let's go back to the table and see how we can improve or change, change to make it better. So there's also a lot of engagement with a internal stakeholders like the, the medical staff and right. patients, all that. Yes, and that is why we, we, we coined the term co-design, because mm -hmm. it's not us sitting at a table in an office, putting things on paper and then saying, do this. No, 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 no. We go, and, 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 and I really want to say thank you to the nurses and the doctors who have been helping us <laughs> along the way so far. They sit down and say, this is what we do now. And so we compare it to what we call guidelines. So this is what you do, but what is the minimum requirement? So we, we improve you, we improve your services, we improve the facilities, we improve your competencies to a level of what, where it should be even at the international market, on the regional mm. market. And then as we improve that services, as we improve the services, then we will decide, okay, you know what? They're doing well. So They're doing well. So, so it's, it's the co-design says we're working with both the healthcare professionals, mm. and then as we go along, we are listening as well to the patients. Mm. And that is where we do survey questionnaires. And that's why I say it's going to take a little bit of time, people, but we need to get your feedback. Because it's based on your feedback, we will know if we're doing what we're supposed to do and we're doing it well. So could you speak a little bit about what sort of impact, let's say, mm. that you think may occur with regards to, let's say, your social, economic, environmental impacts of PBF? That's a big question, Mr. Mm -hmm. Compton. Like why? I mean, you may, you may, what you say now may be wrong, but is there anything that you expect I know PBF is, is relatively new, new to the Eastern Caribbean, mm -hmm. but do you, do you see any, other than it, do you see any negative impacts of the, the launching PBF initiative or do you mostly see any, uh, uh, po just positives? So we are going to make assumptions here and that's okay to make assumptions because they do formulate the pattern for risk analysis going forward. And I'm trying to make, I'm trying to stay as simple as possible so that the public and everyone understands what we're trying to do. Impact, socially, let's go at the social aspect. We are trying to be more, as I said, accessible and have a community-based intervention. So we, we want to hear the voices. And that is bringing us together. I would say it's, it's, it's more of a unity and togetherness. Um, health is in all policies. And so when we look at the social aspects of it, for instance, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to give a case scenario. Mm. An individual of 25 years, they come to us and they do screening and we realize, hmm, you're at risk right now for, uh, you, you're borderline to being a hypertensive. 25 years what mm. could you be stressing about like that this requires us now to take some intervention such as counseling let me just uh, hold off on you right there just mm. hold on to that thought we're due for another break this is issues and answers i am jack kingston compton just stay tuned we'll be back in a bit mm -hmm. Welcome back to Issues and Answers. I am Jacques Kingston Compton, and we're here talking with Ms. Ira Isaacs, the Monitoring and Evaluation Specialist of the St. Lucia Health System Strengthening Project. And we are talking about 
monitoring and evaluation of the performance-based financing system in the healthcare sector. Mm -hmm. So yes, you were speaking about... Um, the social aspects. Right. So what the impact that we are hoping to have, and we are assuming, right, is that to have more community-based interventions. And the community-based interventions meaning we want to have a partnership with our communities, our patients, in how we are giving them care. It shouldn't be just based on Yes, the science is good, but there's a social aspect of it. People are also, they have their own opinions. Quality of life, and, and we've seen it, a person who is 25 years, borderline, hypertensive, you're 25. And, and this is a reality in some, of the, some, of, some cases that we're seeing. Our persons are getting younger and younger with diabetes and hypertension. Mm. COVID-19 showed that, that, that the, 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 there, is a, there is something happening in our society. But we're waiting for them to come to us. <laughs> We now need to go to them because waiting on them to come to us, it's taking a bit, it, it, it's, we're capturing them when they're almost at a point where they're having the onset of the disease. Mm -hmm. And we need to do some preventative measures. So that, uh, that brings me to a couple of questions. One, why are you specifically targeting diabetes and hypertension? And... Um, do we, the St. Lucia as a culture, have an issue with coming to the doctor first, or do we just like to wait? Do you find in your research that patients like to wait until the very last moment when, it's, when, they're, when there's something wrong? There's so many dynamics to that question. There's so many dynamics. You see, one, we have to have a real, let's, let, let's, let's have an honest conversation on the fact that we do have a shortage of healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. And so as much as I'm sitting here and say, we want to come to you, the same nurse that you're meeting in the wellness center, at the health centers as you call it, is the same nurse who's going on the, in the communities most of the time, yeah? And so when we look at it, it needs that we need a restructuring and we need to, we need to bolster our response in the sense that we need to start training other persons. And maybe we don't need to just look at it from an aspect of it has to be a nurse. Yeah, we can train other persons to help us be the front line in the communities doing an assessment. Persons don't come to us a lot of the times because they're busy working. Most of the time a person works from eight to five. Mm -hmm. Eight to five. And for them, um, for them to come to us or to seek health care, they need to leave their jobs, come to the health center. I'm talking about the working class. Uh, and, and persons have their lives living for whatever reasons. So it's a case where now we are looking at it from an aspect where we're doing this is how do we really meet them where they are without burning the healthcare professionals and bringing them, not going to them, meeting them with occupational um, health in the workplace is something mm -hmm. that we would look at as well. Money, finances, persons have their lives living and they might not be able to afford care. Now, persons might say when you go to the public health um, facilities, it's free. Some aspects of it is free, not all of it. But then what if a person is getting paid by the hour? So then uh, they have to leave, what, two, three hours to come to us and then that's the revenue that they're losing. Um, for the person who is 25 and, and, and probably having issues, do you need counselling? So this is patient management. It, it goes way further. You might say you're just checking some body pressure, but when you check the pressure, there's going to be, and there's something wrong, we need to see how to fix it. I'm sorry for putting it fixed because <laughs> I don't think people are broken. I just think they need help, but that's it. Um, how do we help you get to the best health? So, I don't know if I answered the question because you asked, you asked, you know, why? But there are so many, so many reasons why. But do, do you also find that um, there's a high prevalence of diabetes and hypertension in the country? Is, it, is that really what, what you're trying to tackle? Yeah. Yes, there is. And COVID-19 showed us that. Mm. And a lot of persons did not know they were hypertensive and diabetic. And uh, I, I, I remember Dr. Sear was here once and she was speaking to us and she said, we're seeing more and more persons who are younger getting, um, coming in with onset of diabetes and hypertension. Mm. And that, that young group is adding now, before, because before diabetes and hypertension was a coin, I don't think people are old. A sort of old, an older person's older disease person. kind of thing, yeah. I don't believe people are old, I just think they mature. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, it was supposed to be one of those diseases you don't have to worry about when, until you're what, 50, 60? Mm -hmm. And now you're 25 and 30 and younger sometimes. And so, yes, we've seen that it is greening the population and it's an, it's an open door for other things. Kidney failure, mm -hmm. strokes. Hmm? These are some of the things, obesity. So it's not just diabetes and hypertension. If it's not managed and managed well, it, it there are other complications. Mm -hmm. So your MNE process will also help determine why yes. people at that age, so mm -hmm. much younger, are now mm -hmm. suffering from hypertension especially, mm -hmm. especially. Right. And this is where when you sit with the person, you ask questions. Again, we're not trying to pry into your business. We're trying to see what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. Is it work? Is it your diet? Is it lack of exercise? So that gives us the ability to ask you question. And if you can please honor it as honest as possible, then we can say, okay, these are what you need, these interventions. So we can get you a social worker. We can liaise with someone to get you the assistance that you need. So this is, it is like creating a whole new model of how we deal with our patients. So it, it, it's not nurse, I stress at home. Okay, so we need to find your psychologist or a counselor. Why haven't you taken your medications this morning? Mm. Nurse, when I take it on an empty stomach, I don't feel well. Why are you taking it on an empty stomach? Well, you know, the children had to go to school and I didn't want to have to eat the bread, so I wanted to give, you know, mm -hmm. you find the sacrifices that people make. So then, okay, we need a social intervention. This is somebody who doesn't have enough to eat at home. What can we do? It gives us the ability to look for help for you. Monitoring evaluation helps with that. Are we really meeting your needs? It's not just healthcare. You, there are social needs, there's emotional needs, there's psychological needs. We want to look at a person holistically. Yeah, we want to help you as an individual, all aspects of you. And to do that, you need to let us help you by giving us the information that we need. Exactly. Now we're coming closer to the end of the program. And I just want to ask you just one final question. So I know performance-based financing or PBF will eventually lead to the implementation or development of a, a national health insurance program or, mm. or universal health care. Mm. How does your m and &E process help in that regard? Very good question. So we only have a few facilities now that we are piloting the, the PBF, the performance-based financing model. And so what we will do is that it, it carries the same, we call it an essential package, yeah? essential baskets of package, anything you want to coin it like that, is that we have a list of services that we want to give you. Mm -hmm. And we want to look at how well are the services responding to your needs, to the health sector, to the persons? And so when we evaluate it, we can say, yes, it is a very good program. It is preventing persons from, from becoming uh, or from leading to more complications. They're coming back, they're managing well, their diabetes um, and their hypertension are manageable. And so we can say, okay, so this is a really good program. It's working for our people. It's working for our healthcare professionals. And mm -hmm. so we can upgrade it or, or, or what you say, scale up to other facilities, implement it elsewhere. Why is that important? Because it's, it is really taking the same coin of what the National Health Insurance does. The National Health Insurance gives a set of services that you pay some, we pay the rest, whatever, however the model looks, but it is based on your needs as a community, as a people, as a nation, making it affordable, accessible. And so that gives us the idea, before we go into the NHI, what are some of the areas that we need to strengthen? Competency of our healthcare professionals, equipment at the healthcare facilities, the layout of our healthcare facilities, because we realize our demographics is getting a bit mature, not old, as I would say, but mature. So maybe we need to put ramps. We need to look at the chairs that we're given in the waiting room. Comfort. Comfort is and, and just being, I would say, not just comfortable coming to us, but feeling like, you know what? I'm happy I'm here and that you will return. Right. So 
I want to thank you very much for your time with us. I've actually learned a lot and I hope St. Lucia has as well. And I really hope that the performance-based financing initiative works well for our healthcare in the future. Yes. Uh, but thank you very much for You're coming. You're welcome. And I know the terms. Uh, my, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. This is not the first time you'll be seeing this. Phase. Yes, because I, I actually hope that you will come back later and talk yes. to us about the development A bit more of the program as it goes along. Yes, definitely. And thank you for staying tuned. This is Issues and Answers, a production of the Government Information Service. And we hope you see you again next time. Mm.